Now it is superfluous for me to write you about the uh, offering of the saints. Well, I was looking this over this morning, I thought I covered that last time. But he must have, he mentioned that, I guess, in the 8th chapter, too. They were having a drought and, and uh, difficulty down in Jerusalem, and some of the brethren there were uh, in economic trouble. And other brethren of the churches from, you see, uh, Corinth is way up in Greece, and uh, those for quite a distance away were sending food and goods and a great deal of supplies down there for them. Now it is superfluous for me uh, to write to you about the uh, offering for the saints. For uh, I know your readiness, of which uh, I boast uh, about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that uh, Achaia has been uh, ready since last year, and uh, your zeal has stirred up uh, most of them. I might pause right here to mention that we see a lot of things as you go through First and Second Corinthians about the church there at Corinth. And uh, you know human nature hasn't changed, and people are going to deal the same today. Conditions in the church are still more or less the same. We see many things that are, are similar. Now, they were filled with zeal, and they were stirred up, and their zeal was stirring up others. They were uh, an up-and-ready uh, people, and yet they were having trouble. And some of them wanted to follow one man and some another, and... Uh, they wanted to believe some of them this, and some of them believed that, and they didn't all believe the same thing. Now, Paul had to start out his very first letter of correcting them on that, that they must all speak the same thing. In other words, if uh, A believes one thing, and B disagrees with him, and believes something else, one of them is wrong. Now, the church must be right. The church must get right. If we are not right, we must get right. It doesn't mean that we take anything we want and we just say that that is right. That doesn't make it right. We could be wrong. If we are, we must change and get right. But we must be right. And whoever is not must get right, and then we must all speak the same thing. Now, that's why we must have a policy, and we do in the church today. We must all speak the same thing. If any minister or any lay member, if any lay member, for example, thinks the church is wrong about something, he can go to his minister about it. Now, if he uh, doesn't get any satisfaction there, uh, I don't want to encourage everybody to start just snowing me under with things, but on the other hand, I want people to feel free that they can come to me. But I want to do that in such a way that I don't invite such a, uh, an avalanche of, of things that uh, it's impossible for me to get to them or to answer all of them or to see them all. I, uh, I would rather that they would not come to me unless it is really uh, serious and they feel they need to. And the funny thing is that sometimes it's a crackpot that comes to me. I can often tell by the outside of a letter. It usually will be a very thick letter. It will run into many, many pages, 10 to 20 pages at least, and usually written on both sides. And, and then after they have written a whole page, they write up and down the margin sidewise. And they write all over the outside of the envelope. But they're sure I'm dead wrong. Well, uh, I don't know. I, uh, I, I think such people must have a right to get through and to write to me, and their letters do come to me. Now, uh, some that are enemies will say sarcastically, well, I can't write to you because I know that no letter would ever get through to you. Oh, yes, they do. The letters do get to me. But... Uh, I can't give a long personal answer to every letter. 
Now, I write constantly. I have to write uh, one ad every week, a full page, for the Wall Street Journal. Right now, temporarily, we're not using them in the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and uh, certain other newspapers, but I hope that we will get back to that. But uh, the Wall Street Journal is, by long odds, the most valuable single medium that we could use. Because, first of all, we must reach our own people and our own nation. We have a warning to get to this nation of what is going to come to pass. It's that much more than just announcing the gospel that is coming. We have a warning to announce to them. And uh, although we have uh, the gospel to announce to all the world and unto all nations. But the Wall Street Journal reaches more than a million and a half of the very top-level people of the United States. I mean that are top in the world, as the world regards those that are at the top. I mean the people who own everything that is owned in this country, who own the big businesses, the big industries, who own all of the businesses that... Uh, are uh, on the stock market and or issuing bonds or stocks, the main bankers of the nation, the main politicians of the nation. I uh, should dare say that uh, you reach practically all of the members of the Congress, both the House and the Senate, through the Wall Street Journal. I, I just can't imagine many of them who, who never look at it and don't read it. And uh, it is so arranged that you, you get uh, uh, world news and feature news. You, you get it quickly, just in few words, boiled right down. That you get the main kernel of it, the main meat of it, without going into all of the long-winded explanations that you get in the average day of a newspaper or in a magazine, in the uh, weekly magazines like uh, Time, Newsweek, United States News, and others. And the Wall Street Journal uh, reaches those that are at the top in the universities, the top in the banks, the top in the big industries, and those who own stocks or bonds. And that gets into let's say, a million and a half or two million that are at the top and who are running the whole nation of about 225 or 230 million. But those are the one and a half to two million leaders. And it's an enormous privilege to be able to uh, reach them. And I have to write an ad once a week and then once a week, I have to write for the Pastor General's report for all of our ministers. I have to have something every two weeks or approximately two weeks in the worldwide news. I have to uh, write a personal beside articles every month for the two magazines, The Good News and The Plain Truth. I have to write a co-worker letter every month and about twice a year, a semi-annual letter to the entire uh, subscription list of the plain truth. That means an awful lot of writing. That's a great many full articles a month. Now I have just completed writing the feature article for the, uh, I think it won't get to run until the April number. It'll be on the newsstands, though, by March the 20th. Actually, it'll all be completed within 30 days or less now. But it has to come out way ahead of time because they have to ship. After it's printed in the United States, they have to ship copies of that magazine abroad to other nations around the earth. The circulation is not so large that it can be printed in England and in Germany and maybe in Italy and maybe in Japan and other nations. It's, it's just printed only in the United States and has to be sent from here. So they work way ahead of time. And even though I've already completed the article and was sent in about 10 days ago, uh, it won't appear 
until near the end of March. However, that was a long lead article. It'll be the cover story in Quest magazine, which is, after all, the leader in the quality group of quality magazines in the United States. And uh, it's in the same class with, uh, like, Harper's and, uh, let's see, there's another one still extant and still being published. Uh, is it Century? Well, there was Century and there's Harper's and there used to be World's Work and there used to be a number of other magazines. A lot of them have gone out of business long ago. But uh, we had a quality group of magazines uh, 50 years ago, 60, 70 years ago in the United States. Well, Quest is in that group. And uh, it's a very, uh, a very high-class magazine. Its slogan is "The Pursuit of Excellence." However, now uh, something else along that line. While I'm on it, who was it saying the other day that is generally recognized by uh, people even uh, near the top in some of the major religious? Uh, or, or uh, religious organizations or churches like the Roman Catholic or various Protestant churches like the Methodist, the Baptist, Presbyterian, and, and so on, that uh, the one leader in the religious field of magazines is the plain truth. And any who will be candid about it recognizes that there is no other magazine in the religious field remotely of the quality of the plain truth. It is at the helm. It is the best. And it is a magazine now of around two million or more circulation. It is printed in five different languages, and we may soon come out with a sixth or seventh language. And... Uh, uh, it, it, it is a marvelous thing that God is doing, and this church, small as we are, is one of the most powerful voices that even is a religious voice. I was about to say the most powerful voice God has. Well, uh, God, uh, most of these other voices that are religious voices are not God's. So I couldn't quite finish that sentence. I couldn't say it that way. But... Uh, uh, even those that the world regards as religious voices. Small as we are, we are a bigger voice in the world and with more power and reaching more people than the large Protestant bodies and other great religions of the world, largely through our printed matter and through the public press. There's the old saying, the the pen is mightier than the sword. And that is true. We are wielding the pen in a way that is telling in this world. And we are reaching the great and the mighty in the world. And in the last 12 years, I have been personally reaching the great and the near great again. I had personal contacts with the great and the near great in the United States in the industrial and financial uh, field of the United States, just in business in my early life during my 20s, as a matter of fact, between age 22 and 30. In recent years, God has given me a great deal of contact, personal, private contact, with heads of many governments around the world. And so, while we're a small church compared to churches of many, many millions of members, like the Methodist or the Baptist or uh, such churches, we wield a power that very few realize. And the gospel is getting out, and after all, that is the purpose of the church. And those who think that we are weak are misunderstanding us entirely. They are selling us away short, because the voice of God is back of this, the hand of God, and the power of God. And that is the power that carries this work on. 
Now, we, uh, we see connection here with the church back in Corinth. Uh, they were zealous, and uh, they were a brave mind. They, uh, they had zeal. They, they wanted to get going, you know, uh, but uh, they were a little misguided. And so at first uh, some were saying one thing and some another. Some wanted to follow one man and some another. And uh, here we find that they were actually uh, uh, priding themselves on uh, being liberal-minded and everything and keeping a very great sinner in the church who was continuing his sin. Now remember, God forgives sin once we repent of it and turn away from it. Paul would not have cracked down as he did in the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians on that, if that was some sin the man had done several years before and that he had turned away from it, Paul wouldn't have mentioned it. But it was a continuing sin he was then still doing. Paul said, put him out of the church. You know, God does not intend to punish us so much for what we did. It's for what we are doing, and God's punishment is corrective to stop us from doing it. Not revenge because we did do it. You don't make up for your past sins by your own suffering, suffering of punishment. Your suffering of punishment is not going to expiate some sin you committed yesterday or 10 or 30 or 50 or 70 years ago. It takes the suffering of Christ to pay that for you. And once you have repented of it and turned away from it and turned to God, God forgives the sin. Christ has paid for the sin. He doesn't make you pay for it. But if you're going to continue in the sin, and it's a present sin now continuing, God is going to punish you, and he's going to correct you. That's why he says that God punishes every son he loves. And if we are without punishment or chastisement from God, we are not sons of God, we're bastards. That's pretty strong language. But he's talking about present, continuing sin that you're in do still. And so it's still going on in your life. He's not talking about a sin that you turned away from a long time ago. I wonder if we understand that. Well, people don't, you know, people want to punish someone for something they did a long time ago. If the uh, police, the law enforcement system of this world and the legal justice system of this world, which is not justice, if they can learn of a very serious crime, whether it is a very uh, large bank robbery or uh, a murder or some very serious crime, committed a year ago, two, three, five years ago, if they can catch the man who did it, they're going to get him and bring him before a court of justice. They're going to try him and they're going to want to punish him. They don't understand God's system of justice, God's system of punishing. God doesn't want to punish that man. He wants to bring him. Is he still in it? Is his mind still on it? Is it still in his attitude? Is it still in his heart to want to continue that way? Would he do it again? That's what God is concerned about. God is not concerned about our past sins. I don't know why people can't understand that. Every one of us are sinners. Everyone who ever lived except Jesus Christ, every human being has sinned. And sin is a spiritual thing. I wrote an ad along that line for the Wall Street Journal that none of you have seen yet. 
And uh, it's, it's quite a simple thing. I, I, I would like to take time to just read a little bit of it. Let me see. It's right here, I think. Where is it? Yeah, here it is. It's kind of a great big why, and it's a little different in the, uh, in, in the type of layout and display than the other ads. Then, I think this will be along two columns or something, but in one, there's a we can, and then under it, send men to the moon and back. And again, produce uh, computers and most intricate machinery. Next, build uh, giant industries, manage finance, develop science, technology, learn secrets of uh, physics and chemistry, build cities, build nations, civilizations, all those things we can do. But then we can't solve our problems eradicate our evils within each little unit of a home and family or within the nation or between nations. We can't solve our problems and our troubles and eradicate our evils that are harming and hurting everybody. Why? Now, I read the Wall Street Journal. I'm learning a lot by it. I read their ads, and there's some good ads there, and I'm going to use Wall Street Journal ads in my ads. I'm going to make them, and the people whose ads are publishing, and they're spending money for those ads just like we are. I'm going to make them read our ads. There's one ad I'm going to use. They use four, uh, three whole pages. They've used it twice, the same company, but they use one on something that they're working on and inventing, the telephone of the future. It won't be as so yesterday's telephone had a dial that you, you twirl the dial around with your finger. They could have gone farther back. You had one you, uh, you use a crank on the side of the wall of your home and you have to get the number, give the number to a central, and she uh, she gets the number for you. Then we have the dial system. Now we have the punch system. You just push a, a one or several digits on the, on the thing. Tomorrow, it'll be something about the size of a pocketbook of matches that cigarette smokers probably carry along with them if they don't carry a lighter are probably not much bigger than an ordinary cigarette lighter, or, uh, yeah, cigarette lighter. And it, it will have a computer in it. Instead of a big telephone book, it will get you the number wherever you want the number. It will get the person for you. It will answer things for you. It, oh, it's amazing what they're going to do. Oh, yes, they're going to do amazing things. Now, the re last week's issue of uh, uh, Newsweek magazine featured uh, several pages and color pictures about Saturn. And here the uh, unmanned spaceship Voyager has come comparatively close. That means about a million miles, and they call that being close to Saturn. If, after it had been fairly close to Jupiter, now it's gone close to Saturn and tele or, or, or photographs back, sends back photographs of things that no telescope man could ever have on Earth can see. Now they learn new things and they say it's mind-boggling to the scientists themselves. The thing you they can do! Well, it reminds me that God said that at the Tower of Babel, he said, No, nothing shall be restrained from man which he's imagined to do. In other words, in the material and materialistic sphere, there is no limit to what the human mind can do. But we can't solve our problems and our troubles. 
We can't eradicate our evils. Why? Because they are spiritual in nature, and the things we can do are material and physical in nature. We solve the physical problems of physics and of chemistry and of gravity and of the universe and going to the moon, sending a man to the moon and back, sending an unmanned spacecraft to land on the very surface of Mars and send back photographs of the surface of Mars. That's an amazing thing. The computer is an amazing thing. The things that man can do, they're phenomenal. But the things he can't do, he can't even live right with his wife and his children. And children can't live as they should with their parents. And we don't seem to have a sense of morality. And we can't rid ourselves of crime. Now this ad goes on. Let me just read a little more of it. I, I think it's important that we get some of these things in this Bible study. One, I've got a, a number of sentences here. Here's one. There has to be a cause for every effect. Okay, I say that again and again and again. Two, the effect, unsolvable problems, troubles, evils. And that involves a way of life. Always the effect of a cause that brings such evil effects involves a way of life, and the cause is a way of life. Right? Well, people don't stop to think of that. Third, there are two primary ways of life. I call one the way of give, the other the way of get. And they travel in opposite directions. Both are spiritual in nature. Give and get are spiritual ways. They're spiritual in nature. Not material or physical. Now statement number four. All our troubles and evils are caused by the getway of life. Therefore, our world problems, troubles, and evils are spiritual in nature. Now, point five. The mind-boggling, almost miraculous accomplishments of modern man are all material and physical in nature. These wonderful things that man can do are all material and physical. They're not spiritual. Spiritual things he can't do. Spiritual things he knows nothing about. I'm reaching a group of people that think they are all-knowing. They know all about finance. They know all about industry. They, all, they know all about markets and sales and cost accounting and profits above all. They discuss the international condition. There's one thing that's on Friday nights, and I wish it weren't. I, I don't know whether it's right or not to look at it, but we need to know what's going on in the world, even for the Sabbath sermon. And that is the, what do they call it? Uh, well, it's the week. Anyway, they get about five of, of uh, the top newsmen from, uh, there will nearly always be one from the Wall Street Journal, there will nearly always be one from the Los Angeles Times, and there will always be one from the New York Times. There will often be one from the Washington Post or the other Washington newspaper, and uh, there will be one from the Baltimore uh, paper, but they are usually their Washington correspondent, the, co oh, the Washington Week, I believe they call that program. It's on, on the um, educational channel. It's not on regular network programming at all. I don't know what channel you'd find it on in uh, L.A. It's on uh, Channel 6 here, but it's the top people. Now, they're very knowledgeable. I think that those men will look with contempt on the things, or will they, that I put in the Wall Street Journal for them. 
they are the people that will read. I look at those men last night. They're the very people that are going to read these ads I'm writing. You betcha they're going to read them. I've got to make that kind of men think. And they think they know it all. Because they think all there is is the physical and the material. They don't know there is anything else. They say there is no spiritual. And yet their troubles are spiritual. The world's troubles are spiritual. All of the things they're discussing, and there was a discussion last night about just just what is Iran going to do in this war? What about uh, the Soviet Union? Are they going to intervene if, if, if this trouble of this uh, Union strike goes any further in uh, Poland? And uh, how, how are they looking now at our president-elect Reagan? And how do they think is going to happen? And these men, you see, they're very important men. They're very knowledgeable. They think they know all there is to know. They think there's nothing to know except there's something that is material and physical. And yet they're numbskulls when you get down to it. The most important things to know are spiritual, and they don't know spiritual things. Let me proceed a little bit with this. The mind-boggling, almost miraculous accomplishments that these men pride themselves on, and I think it's so great, of modern man are material and physical in nature. There seems to be no end. It's just like God said at the Tower of Babel. There's no limit to what man can do if God lets him go on doing it. But that is physically, in a physical realm. Now, point six. Conversely, human man seems helpless before his problems, his troubles, and evils because they are spiritual in nature. Always a great man when it comes to dealing with machinery, with gadgets, with the forces of nature that are physical forces. But he is a helpless weakling that has no power whatsoever when it comes to how to handle his own children, his own family, when it comes to getting along with other people, when it comes to how can this nation get along with other nations, how can this nation get along with itself, how can capital get along with neighbor, how can black get along with white. How can this interest get along with that interest, even within our country? And the answer is they don't. All right, point seven. Although the opposing opposite directions of the two broad ways of life, which are give and get, the only two ways of life there are when you get down to it, they are the two broad ways of life, give and get, are spiritual in nature, the human mind can discern these two ways. They can know there's a difference between give and get. The human mind can discern these two ways. I use the term give to simplify the way of outflowing love, love toward God and toward man. I might say I couldn't put this in the ad of the Wall Street Journal. Love toward God involves some things they don't understand. One of them, for example, the fourth, there are only four broad commands, and the fourth one is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. They can't see where that has anything to do with it. Like I used to say when I was 11 years old, what has that got to do with the price of putty? They don't know. Why is it wrong to take God's name in vain? Why is it wrong to have some other interest that becomes a God in front of the true God that is nothing but your hobby or your interest or something like that? That's clear beyond them. But I, 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 I just didn't cover that phase of it. Love toward God and toward man. That is, cooperation, helping, serving, sharing. Uh, the term get I use to simplify self-centeredness, vanity, 
covetousness, envy, jealousy, hostile competition, leading to strife, violence, war, and destruction. Now, man can discern those things, and those are spiritual values. So the man can, the mind, the human mind can discern those. Point eight, the human mind can grasp this, this basic spiritual law, and the law of give is, is merely the law of God. It's the basic spiritual law of God. This inexorable way of give, as opposed to the way of get, the human mind can, if willing, turn from, repent of, the way of get, the way of hostile competition. But how many are willing? Even though a true renewing of the mind requires the addition of a spirit nature ungrasped and not understood even by the professional theologians, point nine, what is not understood by the best minds today, including psychologists and theologians, is the makeup of the human mind. It is made up of a human brain with an added spirit content. The spirit content is not the human person, is not an immortal soul, but an added spirit content which empowers human brain with intellect, with power of thought, power of psychic reasoning. Yet the human mind, with this immaterial spirit content, can only know materialistic knowledge, that which the physical brain can see through the eye, can hear through the ear, can smell, taste, or feel, all through the various part, but it's the brain that uh, actually does the feeling and the seeing and the hearing and the feeling and so on. Normal human man, therefore, can know only material equations, though he can distinguish between give and get. I put the law of God in such simple things that a carnal mind can understand it, and a carnal mind can't understand it in Bible language. You see what I'm getting at? Point ten. The world's bestseller, meaning the Bible, reveals the knowledge incomprehensible to the best, most scientifically or intellectually developed minds, which is basic to all our problems, and uh, the way to peace, to happiness, the universal, I've got to rewrite this, universal abundance and real success which goes much further than the acquisition of mere money and material goods. But theologians have glossed over this basic knowledge or twisted or have uh, perverted it or misinterpreted it. Scientists, technologists, business and financial executives have uh, generally ignored it. Our educational system has reared a humanity in a concept and approach to the most important concerns of life that is hostile to this basic knowledge and understanding. So they regard anything like the Bible as something to be regarded as, oh, well, a certain contempt or as mysterious and beyond the people can't understand it or you can prove anything to the Bible and... I'm not interested, and that's not important anyway. Now, that's the way they look at it. Point 11. The manufacturer of a product or a gadget or an appliance sends along with his product an instruction manual to guide the user in know-how and proper use for the intended purpose of the product. The maker of us all sent along with his product, which is the human race, 
his instruction manual, which is the Bible, to guide humanity in the know-how and the proper use for right results, for peace, happiness, real success. But somehow, we have ignored it, we have regarded it with suspicion, we have glossed over much or most of it, we have interpreted it to suit our selfish desires, we have twisted it, maligned it, regarded it as mysterious, impractical, superstitious, and irrelevant. Isn't that the way they've regarded the Bible? So they pay no attention to it whatsoever. Yet it is a now book. It is the only source of down-to-earth understanding. The only source of common sense, wisdom, and direly needed guidance for our lives and our human destiny regardless of whether you're a big executive of a big corporation or who or what you are, or whether you're a scientist, a technologist, a law professor, a bank president, or chairman of the board of many great corporations. It doesn't make any difference. You need that book, which is the only down-to-earth, common-sense book that opens up life and what it's all about and your potential and how to get along and live a successful and a happy life. And they have never looked at it that way, have they? Is God showing me how to reach that kind of a mind? They never looked at this this way. I have to talk to them in their language, though. Point 12. I look at uh, misguided humanity. Some are rich, some poor. Some scholarly, some uh, illiterate. Some uh, economically successful, some economic failures. But almost all, almost all are discontented. Almost all not knowing the incredible human potential, not living a truly abundant and happy life. Is that right? What about these big ones that there's, I think they, uh, and sure there are a lot of people out here that haven't made it. They're, they're ignorant. They're living in filth and squalor. They're poverty stricken. Well, they just didn't have it. I'm, you see, I'm big. Look what I've done. I'm, I'm wealthy. I've been a success. But I'm not happy. That's what he'd better add. He's not happy. He's discontented. He's not satisfied with his success. He wants more. After he got it, he isn't satisfied with it. It didn't make him happy. Material things don't. They can't. Now, why? Again, I ask why. It's time you begin to think about that. This voice now cries out. There's still a voice crying out. This voice now cries out that the all-powerful, unseen, strong hand from some place is soon going to intervene in this world's chaotic, complicated, troubled, and frustrated affairs, and by force compel a misguided and a self-willed and a rebellious humanity to enjoy world peace, to enjoy happiness, universal abundance, and opportunity for eternal joy, the eternal joy of success and ecstasy without the agony of defeat that humanity endures in this life. Your agreement does not matter. If you have read this far, you've been told. And it's as certain as the rising and the setting of tomorrow's sun. That is the intervention of that unseen hand that is going to come very soon. I've got to rewrite that a little bit, but that's the general form of another Wall Street Journal ad. I'll tell you, sooner or later, I'm going to make these proud captains of industry 
these heads of the great banks, if you know any of that kind of men, do you know one that is happy? They just are not. And they still have not solved their troubles. That isn't the kind of a sermon Billy Graham preaches. That isn't the kind of a sermon that uh, Jerry Falwell preaches. That isn't what, uh, what's a call him down at Tulsa, Oklahoma, preaches. That isn't what the, the, the Roman Catholic Church preaches. It isn't what the Methodist Church preaches or the Baptist Church. But that's what God wants from the Wall Street Journal. That's what God wants to get before the top men of this world. Well, excuse me for taking up that time. I get engrossed with it, but I am so concerned about that. It's a situation, and who is there in the world that can reach those people? God wants them reached. God wants someone to say, you've been told. And I tell you, after many years looking back on the results, because God says, by the fruit you know, and I never did know, except I could see it by the fruits finally, that there is a voice crying out now with that message to the world. Now, let's see, I didn't get very far in this. Let's go on. I'm sorry for taking up all the time on that, but I think that is very important right now. Well, I <laughs> see, I had just gotten a few verses. Let's see. Uh, But I am sending uh, the brethren so that our uh, boasting about you may not prove vain in this case, so that uh, you may be ready, as I uh, said you would be, lest if some Macedonians come with me and find uh, that you are not ready, we be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident. So, I thought it necessary to urge uh, the brethren to go on uh, to you before me and uh, to arrange in advance for this gift that uh, you may have produced so that it may be ready not uh, as an uh, exaction, not that we're exacting it from you, but as a willing gift. I, I tell you, I think there's something there. Now, I am the King James, but we'd better read that. Let's see. Yet, uh, have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain. You see, that's not what I thought. Oh, I think what I thought was in here is, is coming a little later. I thought it was this uh, passage about on the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him uh, in store as God hath prospered him. That's not in this place, is it? I wanted to explain that, because that is one thing that so many misinterpret in the Bible to mean taking up an offering every Sunday morning in church. It doesn't talk about that at all. It's talking about this same thing here. The point is, verse 6, uh, the point is this. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he also who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must do as uh, he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. Now, we ought to know that. I'm going to mark that. I hadn't marked that in this Bible because this is a new Bible I haven't used very often. A big print Bible. And you notice there are things along here that we're reading how God gives. God is the one great giver of all in the way of give and get. 
God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that you uh, may always have enough of everything and may provide in abundance for every good work as it is written. He scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness uh, endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your resources and increase uh, the harvest of your righteousness. You see, all of this here is showing you that giving is God's way. And the more you give, the more you will have to give. Now, I saw this. I didn't see it in the just the exact words of give and get back there 54 years ago. But I began to live that way. I saw it as God's law, and I'm just putting it in language that uh, the carnal people that don't have spiritual minds, uh, that they can understand now, of give and get. That's the way that a carnal mind can understand. It's a funny thing. When I began to give and devote a life to giving, God has given to me. And actually, I, I begin to think sometimes, God has not made me wealthy. I can't, I'm not a millionaire. I can't say anything like that. When I was married here uh, three and a half years ago, I didn't have anything in case I uh, died, and I'm quite a lot older than my wife, and so everybody was thinking that uh, I would naturally die first, and I thought that there, I was taking on an obligation that there should be something to leave uh, her in such a case, and uh, expecting that under normal procedures and cases that I would die before she would because she's so much younger. And I had to think, I haven't got a thing I could leave a wife. I didn't own a home. I didn't own an automobile. But I had the use of a very beautiful home in Pasadena on the campus. I had the use of an automobile always. I didn't have any fortune. I didn't have a lot of money in the bank. And yet, God had provided me with enough income and enough of these things that are needed in the work that I was able to enjoy things that even most multimillionaires don't enjoy. For example, God has provided me with a jet plane that has flown more oceans and more, we don't, don't speak of the miles you fly in an airplane, but the hours you fly. And more hours of flying over more oceans and over more distances around the world than any other private airplane in the world. And God had provided me with everything that I need. And here I had a home on the campus in England. Well, I gave that up when we gave up the college and sold the property. I had a home on the campus in Texas. And I don't know, I haven't been over there since we closed up the college. I don't know whether it's still there. I, uh, I know that the, the bed and the bedroom furniture and the bed I slept on and everything has been moved out. That I know because someone asked me if, if he could have it, and I said yes, and so that, that is gone. And uh, I don't know how much of, uh, whether even some of the furniture is still there or not. Uh, we thought we had sold the property, and the sale didn't go through. And so we still have the property. We wanted to sell it because it's costing us several hundred thousand dollars a year just to maintain it and keep it from growing up to weeds. And, uh, and we don't have any real use for it now. Now, by the way, uh, on this last visit to the Middle East, Although we had sold the campus in England, the electric light company that bought it, which is, of course, government-owned, but the officials 
had extended, they were very courteous and extended an invitation to me to come out and, and go over the campus and visit it again. And they had two men there to go around with me. And they showed me every courtesy in the world. And they let me know how glad they were that I had taken enough interest to make it so beautiful and they wanted to assure me of how they're trying to maintain it in all of the beauty into which I had had it built. And, uh, of course, uh, the home I didn't get to go in. I've gone and uh, uh, I left most of the furniture and things there because there was no need of it. Things that I thought we could use that were worth shipping clear to America, I, I shipped, but most of the furniture and heavy things simply stayed. But it was locked and I didn't get to go in there. And I don't know what's happened to the home that I had, but I spent a lot of time there over about a 17-year period. So uh, God gave me a home in Pasadena, one in Big Sandy, one in England. Well, I don't have the one in Big Sandy in England now. But God has uh, arranged for me to have the home in Tucson. And we were just discussing yesterday how God brought us here. If I had been in Pasadena, let me tell you, the church might be destroyed by now. I don't know what would have happened. I would probably be dead. Because when my heart attack came, if that had come to me in the home that I lived in in Pasadena, I doubt very much if I would have been brought back. I would have stayed dead. And several have said, were telling me yesterday, that with the smog and the conditions in Pasadena, that I probably wouldn't have recovered in Pasadena like I did here. But God had me here where the Attorney General couldn't get at me, and where the money could come here, and the work could go on, and they couldn't stop the work. And finally, they just dropped the whole case. Now, t for the time being, we won a complete victory. Of course, it's only one battle. We haven't won the war yet. Satan is still after us. Don't worry. And here are the main news on local news here in Tucson was that a man was on the way out to kill me on Thanksgiving Day. And they couldn't understand how I wasn't worried. They came to the house. I didn't talk to them. My wife did. They said, well, isn't Mr. Armstrong worried? And my wife said, no, not at all. But they couldn't understand that. They thought, well, Armstrong must be crazy. He's not worried. Well, I guess we could have told them as a joke that we've got a deputy sheriff here to protect me, meaning this little dog. That wears the wears the badge around his collar and says deputy sheriff. Actually, of course, we were trusting in God. That's why we weren't worried. But uh, God has given me every blessing in the world and has preserved my life and has kept me going and kept me working. And well, I don't know anybody that's been blessed like I have, and yet I've been persecuted above anyone that I know personally. Isn't that funny? And I wouldn't have had any of this persecution if I had been an entertainer, or if I'd been a businessman, or if I'd remained in the advertising profession. I wouldn't have had any of this persecution. I had been only persecuted because I represent Jesus Christ and for no other reason whatsoever. If they persecuted him, he said they would persecute us. And I'm persecuted only because there's still, Satan is still persecuting Christ, because I represent Christ. So he's persecuting anyone that represents Christ. That's the only reason. You will be enriched in every way for great generosity. Now, be enriched for giving. 
you will get forgiving. But if you try to get, it's going to go wrong. But if your motive and your heart is on giving, that's the way that you don't have to get by reaching out to take for yourself, but it'll be given to you. Notice this. You will be enriched in every way for great generosity. Let me mark that. I'm going to put that in a co-worker letter. <laughs> All of our members and co-workers need to know that. You will be enriched. If you want to get enriched and want to be enriched, that's the way to get enriched. It doesn't mean you'll be rich, but you will be enriched. It means part way toward being rich at least. For great generosity. which through us will produce thanksgiving uh, to God for the rendering of this service not only supplies the wants of the saints, but also overflows in uh, many uh, thanksgivings to God. Under the uh, test of this service, you will uh, glorify God by your obedience in acknowledging the gospel of Christ and uh, by the generosity of your contribution for them and uh, uh, for the others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. God, you see, is the great giver. And all the way through, that's preaching the very thing that I'm trying to preach around the world today. I expressed it and made it very plain to Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister of Israel, in our private talk. I expressed it and made it plain to President Sadat in his palace in Cairo. That give is the way to have. Get is the way... To lose out and not have. The world hasn't learned that lesson. So we just had a chapter that's a pretty good lesson on give and get right there. Now let's see. As we look into this next uh, chapter. Chapter 10. No, I thought that might be this... Uh, that I was looking about. No, I forget where that is right now. Anyway, it's not right here. But it does refer to the same thing. So now, chapter 10. I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold to you when I am away. Now, you begin to learn a little something about Paul's own personality here. I see a little resemblance between myself and Paul, if I may say this there. Paul was strong in writing. Paul's main fort was his writing. Most people today think the Old Testament has done away. They want to take only the New Testament. Who wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else? The Apostle Paul did. The New Testament is, is it's just an awful lot of it. I, I, I never figured it out, but it must be almost half of it, the writings of the Apostle Paul. Of course, uh, well, after you get through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I would say that more than half of the remainder of it is written by Paul. So Paul was a writer. Now, he says he was powerful in writing, but he was uh, sort of timid and weak when he was there with him in person. He was humble. That's what he's trying to say. He really must have been a more or less strong personality at that. But uh, he was humble. But you notice something personally about him. I who am humble when I am face to face with you, 
but bold to you when I am away, because when he's away, he's writing letters. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness uh, with such uh, confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of uh, acting in worldly fashion. Now here he was falsely accused, and others were suspecting him of this, that, and the other thing. Oh yes, there were other ministers always accusing Paul. Poor old Paul. But we still are reading what Paul wrote, and we aren't reading what those accusers said today, are we? For, though we live in the world, we are not carrying on a worldly war. For the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now, what is he talking about? The weapons of our warfare, and we can destroy strongholds. That really, uh, we might turn for a minute, because that turns us uh, uh, directly to uh, Ephesians. It's the sixth chapter, yeah, it's Ephesians. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, put on the whole armor of God, that you may stand against the wiles of the devil. Yeah, here it is. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but uh, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the world, of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places, or wicked spirits in uh, high places. That's where our warfare really is. And Paul knew that. And uh, Paul knew that even the other men, they were only uh, after him because of, of Satan's anger, and that Satan was leading them. Now, men that have been high ministers within the church of God and are outside, they were deliberately led by Satan, but they become infuriated if you tell them that they were serving Satan and letting Satan lead them. Oh, they get mad. They get angry. And they're just almost willing to stand up and fist fight if you say anything about them. Why? Satan couldn't mislead them. They're more powerful than Satan. They get out with Satan. Oh, yeah, could they? Well, let me tell you, I couldn't. If they can outwit Satan, they're a lot stronger than I am. I can't do it. I don't know anyone that can outwit Satan except Jesus Christ. I just don't. I don't, I don't think anyone else can outwit Satan at all. I don't know anyone. I don't know. Maybe Mike or Gabriel could. But I'll tell you, I think Satan would give one of them a pretty good battle because they're on about an equal footing. And if they could outwit Satan, it would only be because God would give them the power to do it. So you see, Paul talked about his, his warfare. It is really spiritual and against wicked spirits. But uh, you see, he said here, for uh, our weapons... And our warfare is not worldly, but divine power. And that we have power to destroy those strongholds and to conquer them. Satan tried to get us through the state of California. Do you think that I would be writing a page like I just read to you for the Wall Street Journal today if Satan hadn't launched that thing against us through uh, the state of California? That great persecution led directly to the ads in the uh, Los Angeles Times and then the New York Times, and that led directly to the Wall Street Journal. The, uh, the great powerful voice, the most powerful door that God has opened to us recently of any kind in the last ten years, I would say. Because it was a little over ten years ago that God began to open the door 
for me to see personally heads of government around the world. But now he's opening up the door to reach the great and the mighty, all of the top people of the whole United States. And believe me, they're reading those ads because God has given me the skill to write so that they will read. Look, I'm not really writing those ads. What do you think I got what I just read to you? That came to me when I first awakened this morning before I was fully awake. I know God put that in my mind. I'm not capable of thinking that well. It, it isn't expressed too well yet. I can see it's got to be rewritten. That's going to be a powerful ad when I get through with it. I'm just not finished with it yet. Now let's see. We destroy arguments and uh, every proud obstacle to the knowledge of God and we take uh, uh, every thought captive to obey Christ being ready to uh, punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that as he is Christ, so are we. You know, we have had members that think they are Christ, but they think that... Uh, I or some of us ministers in the church are not. Paul says, if you think you're of Christ, so are we. We ministers. And, and Christ's ministers are of Christ too, so are we. For even if I boast a little, a, a little too much of our authority, now you notice Paul was in authority, and God gives authority to his ministers in authority, uh, which the Lord gave, for building you up. God has given authority to me, but he's given me authority to build up the brethren in the church, not to tear them down or hurt them. You see, to build you up and not uh, for destroying you. I shall not be put to shame. I would not seem uh, to uh, be frightening you with letters. And Paul could write some pretty strong letters, but he said he didn't mean to really frighten them with, with his strong letters. But the power of God was there. And that's where the power comes from. Paul wasn't a powerful man of himself. Of himself, Paul could do nothing. Of myself, I can do nothing, and I know it. And yet, through Christ, I can do just almost all things. Whatever Christ wants to do through me. Well, he says, uh, I shall not be put to shame. Uh, I would not seem to be frightening you with letters. He didn't mean to frighten them. Uh, for they say, quote, uh, his letters are weighty and strong, but uh, his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. Paul then was not a great orator or a great speaker. He didn't preach, a, he wasn't a preacher of the strongest sermon, but he did know how to write, and he wrote a great portion of the New Testament. And uh, that uh, God has made my ministry even more that of writing than it is that of speaking. And that's so very important. That is the one great advantage that the Church of God today has over the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, the Presbyterian Church, any church, the Roman Catholic Church, any of them. It's the power of print and the printing press of this day. And again, the sword uh, won't compare. The pen is mightier than the sword. Don't forget it. Let such people understand that uh, what we say by letter, when absent, we do when present. Not that we uh, venture to class or compare ourselves 
with some of those who commend themselves. You notice that the others were commend themselves. Paul didn't do that. I don't mean to do that. If I do, I certainly don't mean to. I hope I don't. I don't mean that. But uh, when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. That's verse 12. I want to read that in the King James. For we dare not make ourselves of their number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But uh, they, measuring themselves by themselves, are comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Now, I thought there was something. Anyway, we are told in the Bible not to compare ourselves with ourselves, with one another. But uh, we will not boast beyond limit, but we'll uh, keep to the limits that God has apportioned us to reach even to you. For uh, we are not overextending ourselves as though uh, we did not reach you. We were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limit in other men's labors, but uh, our hope is uh, that as your faith increases, our uh, field among you uh, may be uh, greatly enlarged uh, so that we may uh, uh, preach that gospel in lands beyond you, without boasting of work already done in another's field. And he said that we may preach in lands clear beyond you. In other words, Paul preached over great areas of uh, hundreds upon hundreds of miles, and even over a thousand miles in those days when the going was by a sailboat or a rowboat, or by walking, or by a donkey, or a mule, or a horse, or something of that kind. They had no kind of transportation or communication either like we have today. God didn't say, stay where you are and preach the gospel. He said, go into all of the world and preach the gospel. And that's what I get criticized for sometimes today. But I still do do it, and I still shall continue to do it, because that's, that's what Paul did, that's what God wants done today. Let him who boasts, boast of the Lord, for uh, it is not the man who uh, commends himself that is accepted, but the man whom the Lord commends. Well, that brings us then to uh, the 11th, 12th, and 13th chapters, and we should be able to take those next time and finish Corinthians with the next study.